Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. It is Wednesday, and all of our guests today, as always on a Wednesday, brought to you by our title sponsor, Able Auctions and ableauctions.ca. As we bring in from Sakara and Price, the Rinkwide Podcast, and the Hockey News, uh, Jeff Patterson. Jeff, thanks for doing this, sir. How are you? I'm good, Donnie. I'm hoping that you're not going to ask too many questions about Helga Grams. I, I, I will be up front here and admit that I'm not an expert uh, on Helga Grams. What do you know about uh, the uh, the Canuck player Messer? <laughs> one of my, one of my favorites. One of my favorites. He's a legend. He's a legend. <laughs> hey, before we get uh, delve deeply into hockey, uh, Jeff, you're a big golf fan. You've covered golf. You play golf. Just to... Um, do you think less of the PGA now that it's merged with with Liv? Well, I certainly think I think less of Jay Monahan. Yeah. I mean, it looks like a fair bit of snake oil uh, being sold here to the players, and you know, I, I do feel bad for some of the players. You know, not the superstars; they're always going to make their money. But I mean, it's such a cutthroat business uh, for the guys that you know, struggle just to hold on to their PGA Tour card year after year. There were a lot of those guys that were courted by Liv, and they easily mm-hmm. could have gone, and they showed loyalty to the PGA Tour, and the PGA Tour didn't show loyalty back, ultimately. And I, I'm like everybody. I was surprised by the announcement. I'm still waiting for all of the dust to settle to see how it shakes out here. But I am fascinated by this notion that, you know, the Saudis have all this money. They print money and, and all this money to spend on golf. But Liv wasn't doing, I don't think, what they had hoped it had done in terms of attracting, you know, a television audience, the galleries live on the ground. Mm. Uh, but they had bumped up the finances in the world of golf to the point where the PGA Tour couldn't keep track or couldn't keep up. And so they really sort of did need each other in that sense. And so uh, here we have, uh, you know, I, I guess it's not a merger because, again, I don't fully know what the new entity is going to be called, yeah, how it's yeah. going to look moving forward here. But, yeah, I mean, just shaking the game to its core. And ultimately, there were guys that could have set themselves up for the rest of their lifetimes, their kids' lifetime, their grandkids' lifetime, had they just gone and taken the money from Liv. And instead, they stuck around with the BGA Tour thinking that, you know, they were upholding the integrity of the game. And then it felt like they kind of got smacked in the face yesterday. So it sounded like a heated meeting uh, on the grounds of Oakdale, uh, yeah. the home of the RBC Canadian Open. And again, so many moving parts in all of this. Uh, we'll see what it looks like. What does it look like for the PGA Tour moving forward here? Uh, is any sort, you know, will live exist in any sort of way? And the DP World Tour, the old European Tour, you know, there's, uh, they're certainly involved here. What's the fallout uh, for them? So, yeah, fascinating time in the world of golf, not only because it is the week of the RBC Canadian Open, but the U.S. Open next week. And we saw, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Brooks Kepka, a live guy, winning the PGA Championship. So, you know, stakes are pretty high here in the world of golf right now. And uh, a big couple of weeks and obviously uh, uh, still a fair bit of ground to be covered. Yeah, and there's some talk about compensation uh, for the li- as strange as it might so- sound, given their lifestyles. Some compensation for the players like McElroy and and Tiger and the players who show- showed uh, loyalty. More to come. Hockey, uh, Jeff. We spent the first segment talking a lot about the three way trade yesterday and how the Kings uh, went all out to create a significant amount of cap room. Are you confident? that somehow the Canucks can do the same, and, and if so, what would be the best way for them to go about it? Well, first things first, let me just say, like I was so intrigued by and encouraged the fact that three teams, three general managers could get creative mm. and come up with a deal that really did meet their needs. Columbus wanted a plug-and-play defenseman, and they got that in Provorov. The Philadelphia Flyers signaled that they are in rebuild mode here, but they got all sorts of futures in that deal, including a, another first-rounder. And the LA Kings, they... You know, needed cap space, and they had that Cal Peterson contract that a lot of people in hockey thought might be unmovable. Again, uh, another example, there are lots of bad contracts. I'm not sure there are many unmovable contracts, if you're willing and motivated, like the LA Kings were. But the Kings then got involved and were the broker in the Provorov deal. So, yeah, they eat a little bit of salary there, but they ultimately get uh, the Peterson deal off the books. And that was, you know, first and foremost for them. So now they can sign Gavrikov 
and maybe do something else. And that's where the Canucks have to be concerned because what are the LA Kings up to with this cap space that they gained? You know, they're already ahead of the Canucks in the competitive cycle. Uh, they're a team that's been to the playoffs the last couple of years. They've got lots of good young talent. And so, you know, how are they going to apply the cap space that they created? Is that going to make them a better team and that much harder for the Vancouver Canucks to keep up with one of the teams in their own division? Uh, you know what really encouraged me yesterday, Don, though, was that three teams got together and none of them were the Arizona Coyotes. Like, usually that's the <laughs> dumping ground when there's yeah. one of these trades. Usually the Coyotes are in the middle of it somehow, some way, and they weren't. So, uh, yeah, like, look, a a am I confident the Canucks are going to make something like this happen? I don't know if I'm confident, but <laughs> ultimately they they've got to be cap compliant. That much we know, right? Like, they can't start next season above the, the upper limit. So something has to give. And as you guys have been pointing out, and I've been coming on weekly here, We've all been spinning our wheels looking at different ways to make this happen, whether it's a sweetener, whether it's trading back in the draft, whether it's retaining salary, you know, ultimately the buyout. And I know Patrick Alvin said that it wasn't his intention to use a buyout, uh, but I think he was pretty calculated in the wording there that he wants to explore all those other options, but he did not come out and pound the table and say, we will not write a check to make some of these bad contracts go away. So that is still an option for them, but they've got time on their side here. But more than anything, I think yesterday just showed when you're willing and motivated like these general managers were and you're able to get creative, things can happen. And that's where the Canucks have to find it. Just, they've got to find a way to make something go down here uh, to create a little bit of cap space. Well, uh, Jeff, and I, I get a kick out of, uh, out of all these articles being written. Who should the Canucks go after on July 1st? Well, they might not go after anybody on July 1st if they don't get any uh, create some cap space. There's a real possibility July 1st can come and they might not be active at all for the first time in many years. Yeah, and I think some people would say, hey, that's good because that's where the previous regime ran into trouble, was uh, committing way too much cap uh, allocation on July 1st. But look, y y you can't. You simply can't, as an organization, you can't sell to the fan base that your sole intention in the offseason is to be cap compliant. You have to be cap compliant. So, you know, raise the bar a little bit here, but you can't really raise the bar realistically unless you have a little bit of cap flexibility. But, you know, from day one, when Jim Rutherford came in, was introduced, and he used the term the cap cushion, right? Like, that was 18 months ago. And we've been having these same discussions, and it's just like around and around and around we go. But push is coming to shove because, again, the offseason goal can't just be to be cap compliant. This team has to get better. We've seen that. You've got Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes, two of the best in the business at what they do. Uh, I'm a believer in Thatcher Demko, and if he can bounce back and have a full season like he had down the stretch, then you know there's a third player that's among the best in the business at his position and what he does. But that's not enough. It's not clear. Clearly, it's not enough. They've got to surround those guys and support them. And if you're just going to run it back with the same team from last year and hope that somehow there's improvement from within. You know, that doesn't seem like a sound strategy to me. And if they come up short next year in the playoffs, then really, what have you done? You've just like burned off another year of Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes in their statistical primes. Like, how does that make sense? So, yeah, I mean, look, we all know the objective here, but obviously it is proving difficult and has for the better part of a year and a half now for the Vancouver Canucks to offload contracts that'll give them some flexibility to go out into the marketplace and try to improve this hockey club. Uh, you were tweeting about uh, Vegas, uh, Florida. You said uh, teams that take a 2 nothing lead in the Stanley Cup Finals uh, go on to win 90% of the time. I saw your tweet. Uh, so you're saying no chance, no chance for Florida at all. A little bit. Hey, if anybody in hockey knows <laughs> that a 2 nothing lead in the Stanley Cup Final uh, isn't money in the bank. It's Roberto Luongo, right? Like yes, he was yes. on the he was on the right end. Well, the right end of being up two nothing back in 2011. Now he's on the on the other side. But he knew then that uh, you got four. You need four wins. It's not just getting to two wins first. So uh, unbelievable, though. Roberto Luongo in Stanley Cup Finals and as a player and now as a manager, the road has not been kind to Bobby Lou. We know what happened in Boston back in his playing days, and now. Uh, these first two games in Vegas. So Roberto Luongo has yet to be a part of the winning team on the road in a Stanley Cup final in his career. Uh, look, Matthew Kachuk is an incredible player. He's had a great season and a great playoff run. He knows how valuable he is to the Panthers. He can't be valuable to them if he's in the penalty box or in the locker room after getting tossed uh, with another misconduct. So uh, it's a fine line. 
I mean, the hit on Eichel was incredible. Um, you know, and then he serves his time and comes out and scores a goal. Like that's Matthew Kachuk, but uh, he's so much more valuable to the Panthers on the ice doing what he can to help them win hockey games. So a little more discipline there. And we'll see. I'm not writing the Panthers off. They've been an incredible story. They were down to the Boston Bruins. They came back, you know, and then they yeah, kind of got caught lightning in a bottle, rolled over Toronto and Carolina. So uh, obviously game three is massive. If they go down three, nothing, then it's pretty much done. But if Florida gets the next one, then, you know, who knows? Like, you know, they always say is you're not out of a series until you lose a home game. So I'll give Florida every opportunity. I think they've earned that much. But all of that said, the way that this Vegas team is going, top end guys, depth forwards are scoring, three goals from defensemen already in this series through two games of the Stanley Cup final. My goodness, when you think about the Vancouver Canucks and, you know, the lowest scoring team in the NHL with goals from defensemen this past season, and then you get Vegas, uh, you know, in the highest of leverage games, getting three goals from their back end. Uh, there's just so many ways that the Vegas Knights can beat you. And when all else fails, you got Aiden Hill authoring just this incredible story between the pipes as well. So my prediction was Vegas in five. I'm sticking with it. But again, I think Florida at least has earned the benefit of the doubt to see what they can do on home ice here uh, in game number three. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for this. Uh, we, I want to ask you about Vasily Petkolzin because of the Cole Caulfield contract. We'll save that uh, for next week, hopefully. Jeff, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Well, Donnie, let's hope next week that we have a massive three-way trade involving the Vancouver Canucks to talk yeah. about. Yes, yeah. even, yes. If, even if it's with the Coyotes. OEL Fair going enough. back to Arizona. At, at this, hey, at this point, I would take the Canucks and the Coyotes and some other team getting involved in making something happen. You know me, yeah. do something. You yes. should reserve for the players. This time, it's for Patrick Elvin. On or off the ice. Thanks, Jeff. You bet.